<laughs> There's good stuff in all of them, but I will agree. I will not be that person who would say, oh, it's all easy to read. There are some parts that are definitely difficult to read. Uh, if you have your Bibles, if you open to Exodus chapter 15... Uh, I believe that there's some great takeaways from what we're seeing in Exodus. Now, I've agreed with everything that everybody said as far as people are commenting on the post. Uh, comments like, um, man, aren't you reminded of how holy God is as you see the preparation of the tabernacle? And I agree with that. And that is a great takeaway. And, and other things that people were noting about the children of Israel, how that they were so gripey and complaining. I don't even know if that's a word, complaining. But, you know, they were complainers and they were mum and grumblers and gripers and can I just throw in nobody likes a person like that? Hey, if you serve but all you do is gripe the whole time you're serving, then can you do us all a favor and quit serving? Good Lord above. I mean, you know, I'm sorry, does that sound ugly? No. But you know, I mean, some people just, Lord of mercy, I can't even hardly pick my head up. I just am doing so much. Oh golly, I just don't even know how I'm going to survive. Please quit. <laughs> Please quit, because you're making me sick right now. I mean, but when you read the children of Israel, you're like, good Lord, y'all quit mumbling and griping. God's taking you somewhere. You were slaves in Egypt, and He's taking you out. And my gosh, He's he's providing for you. And we want to say, just man, quit griping and grumbling. But I'm glad that we're objective enough that we don't just point our finger at them, but we say, oh yeah, that's me sometimes. That's us a lot of times. And I'm glad that we have the objectivity about ourselves to see that yes, the children of Israel do represent saved people and they do remind me a whole lot of myself a lot of times. But Lord, if I ever get in that griping, grumbling, just woe is me attitude, will somebody please correct me? Like seriously, I'm, I mean that. Like tell me to hush or tell me to get some help or something. But don't let me just scrap on. But you know as you read through the, the story in Exodus and you read about the children of Israel, I think there is such a beautiful picture about the saved believer's life. And that's what I want us to look at this morning. And I want us to take away some things from the, the journey uh, that the Israelites were on. If you look with me in chapter 15, let's look at verse number 1. And I just want to kind of hop around and make some points from here. But if you look at chapter 15, <laughs> verse number 1, it says, Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord. And he spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. He said, The horse and the rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He is my salvation. He is my God. And I will prepare him a habitation. My Father's God, I will exalt him. And I'm always a goofy idiot. You know, when Tina and I were reading uh, through the Bible, I'd say, It says, They sing saying so if you're going to read this you're going to have to sing it you know so I'd say the Lord is my strength and my song he has become my salvation making up my own t tune and just being an idiot really but it says they were singing when they said these things and you know the reason why they were singing is if you look back at Exodus chapter 14 and on my Bible it's right there in the same page it's just a couple verses above it look at Exodus chapter 14 look at verse number 26 well, look at what the Lord had just done. It says, The Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters may come upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. Verse 27, and we know because we read this. It says, Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. No wonder they were singing. They had just witnessed one of the most miraculous and awe-inspiring events that God has ever really done for His people. And He says, I'm going to do this. I'm going to show you how I got your back. He said, I'm going to part the Red Sea. I'm going to allow the waters of the Red Sea to be parted so that you can walk across on dry land. But then I'm going to roll the waters right back over and I'm going to let it drown every one of your enemies who are coming against you. I heard somebody say one time, and I'll tell you this because I think it's funny. I heard somebody say one time that there was a Christian and he had just uh, read again of the story of the, of the parting of the Red Sea and he said, man, I'm so excited. He was telling somebody, he said, I'm so excited. I was just reading about how God parted the waters of the Red Sea. said, just made them divide and the children of Israel walked across on dry land and said, that is, just proves the awesomeness of God and it just excites me so much. And this old person says, you know, I really don't think that's a big deal. Said, 
when I look back on it, said somebody told me who's been over there that the Red Sea's only about ankle deep water. Said so really it wasn't that big of a feat for God to have parted back ankle deep water. I mean, Lord, it's basically like a pond. And the guy said, are you kidding me? Oh my gosh, he said, that makes it even better because then when you keep on reading, God took ankle deep water and closed it back up and drowned all the people of Egypt who were coming after him. He said, oh my gosh, that makes me even more excited. And I've never forgotten that because I thought, I don't care what skeptics would try to say about any kind of oh tide variance or some kind of shallow. No, God divided it so that his people could walk through and he closed it and drowned hundreds of people in chariots. That's miraculous. And that's the God that we serve. So when you get to chapter number 15, it says Moses and all of them, they were singing. And, and when you skip through there, and I don't want to read it all, but, but you read it and, and he says, His chariots and His host has He cast them to the sea. And He's just singing. And they're just so excited. And He says, Your right hand, O Lord, is glorious in power. I mean, it says they were singing, right? Now, if it says they were singing, then when I read it, I sing. Verse number 8, He says, With the blast of your nostrils, the waters were gathered together. <laughs> that sounds like those goofy songs I make up when I'm cleaning the house like gonna get this dust <laughs> y'all do that too don't you but they were singing and they were so excited and I want you to look seriously in verse number 11. He said, Who is like you, Lord? He said, "You, Who is like your glorious and your holiness? He said, You do wonders. And verse 12, He said, You stretched out your right hand and man, the earth just swallowed them. You know, it would do us good sometimes to remember the miraculous things that God has done for us. We ask for hard things, God does hard things, and then we just ho-hum say, oh, thank you, God. But man, when God does something miraculous and, 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 and shocking for us, it would do us good to just make a little hokey song, you know, and say, man, you're so good. Got my mom out of the hospital, you know, and, and you're good and you're powerful. And he was singing, and I want you to look, and I want to tie this over to the Christian experience. Now, if you look in verse number 13, he says, Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Now, if you know me at all, one of my favorite words in the Scriptures is the word redeemed. It's the, the, the idea that when I was young and I was in high school and I was in college and I, I dealt just probably as every other woman does with the constant uh, um, pressures that you're not good enough and, and you just don't measure up in this area and well, this should be changed about you and people would like you more if you weren't like this or if you were like that and when the constant pressures of just being a woman in a society like we're in where you should always be better and you should always be different and when those things would mount up against me and I struggled so greatly with insecurity and self value and low self confidence and no, no self confidence in myself, I remember when the Lord pointed out the word to me but I redeemed you I redeemed you. And in case you don't know the definition, Moses defines it. He mentions the word in verse 13. I circled the word redeemed in verse 13. And then I circled the definition in verse 16. Look at verse 16. He said, he said, till thy people pass over. The last part. He said, Lord, till the people pass over which thou hast purchased. That's what the word redeemed means. It means to buy out of the market. No matter how you feel about yourself, God didn't just get stuck with you. Do you hear me? God didn't just get stuck with you. He saw you. He saw everything about you. And He looked at me. He saw more bad than good for sure. And He saw every fall, every failure. And you know what He said? I'll go to the, ex the extent, whatever it takes, and I'll buy you. I will purchase you because I want you. If that does not make you excited as a person, if that does not make your heart just swell with pride and with joy, then there's something wrong. Maybe your heart's two sizes too small, you Grinch. <laughs> I mean, I'm telling you. And you know what? When I look at what Moses said, he said, oh my gosh, I'm singing to the Lord. He said, I I'm just so excited about what He's done. He said, He redeemed us. He said, we are His people and He has purchased us. And I begin right then to see, oh man, this is just a beautiful picture of the Christian life just like Moses stood there and said, Lord, you bought me. You've redeemed me. 
You did something miraculous and now let's start this journey and let's go forward. That is the same place that every saved person began with God. And let me ask you this. Did you not start off all sing-songy with God about the miraculous thing that He had done in your salvation? Were you not just overjoyed about what He had done in your heart? And He said they sang and then you know what I like and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get Blake on this one. Y'all ready for this? In verse number 20, 20 in, in chapter number 15, verse number 20, it says, Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, she took a timbrel in her hand. <laughs> she got herself a tambourine. <laughs> and if you don't believe me, then Google the word timbrel. It's a tambourine. And I thought, you know what? We need a tambourine in our car. <laughs> now I'm just like Blake. I, I I hate a tambourine. I don't know. I got a love hate relationship with it. You get somebody, and I'm just gonna call her out. Krista Hyman. She can keep the beat, man. She played that tambourine in Pleasant Hills Choir, and sister, it would give me the chills. And I, she could, and and Lee Hollingsworth could play the tambourine, and they were phenomenal, and I loved it. But then you get somebody up there who's just learning. <laughs> I just spit everywhere. But now, you get somebody up there who's just learning. And that's just like biting a soup can in the kitchen. I mean, it is just, it is atrocious. And uh, I was even a member of one choir and I won't even say where, and I don't even know what the darn thing was called. But there was this, it was like a stick. <laughs> it was like a metal, like a soup can, and it had beads. And you just went, shh, 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 shh. <laughs> Woo, I don't know who came up with that instrument, but um, they need to be persecuted for that. But uh, anyway... And it says they were so excited that Miriam took a timbrel in her hand. And it says, and all the women, all the women, hey, you ready? All the women went out after her with timbrels. <laughs> Everybody had a tambourine, and it says, and with dances. <clears throat> I'm going to be honest, I'm just going to throw this in there. You won't convince me that there's anything wrong with my dancing. I'm just, I'm a dancer. Amen. And I ain't a bumper and a grinder. I'm not, you know, I'm not vulgar and inappropriate with my dances. But man, when I get up in the morning and music's playing and I'm in a good mood, now if I'm not in a good mood, you can forgive, I ain't a dancing. But I love to dance. It's just, I mean, isn't that just what, that's to me, that's what dancing is. It means you got a little extra energy and you're feeling good. So you might as well just move while you're doing whatever. And when I'm driving down the road, the people, beside me probably think I'm crazy. I'm bumping my fingers, I'm playing the drums on the steering wheel, you know, and I'm dancing. And it said that Miriam was so excited. She said, tambourines for everybody. <laughs> and they were all shaking tambourines and so excited. Why? Because did you see what God just did? He literally just rolled back water and we walked across it and then He closed the water on those people. He's got our back. And then in verse number 21, Miriam answered them, Sing unto the Lord, he said, For he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. I'm telling you, I read that and I just think about the most excited thing I've ever been excited about was probably when the Lord saved me. And when He began a work in me. And I realized, boy, He's done something miraculous. He who knew no sin. You hear me? He who knew no sin became sin that I could become His righteousness. Lord, you just ponder on that for a minute. He knew no sin, yet He became it. He let His Father turn His back away from Him. He had to change from saying, Hey Daddy, hey Father, to God. Why have you turned your back on me? Because He took my sin. That's miraculous. It's, it's unbelievable. It's phenomenal. That's what He's done for us. And they got excited and they shook those tambourines and they danced. And y'all ready? It's about to change in a hurry. It's about to take a, a big left turn. And 22 says, So Moses brought Israel out from the Red Sea. They were so excited. They went out into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days into the wilderness and they found no water. That sounds like... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it was a party. We were all dancing. We were shaking our... Tambourines. <laughs> I see you know tambourine team now. Yeah, yeah. And they were shaking those tambourines and they said, Lord, you're so good. You are glorious. Oh man, look what you've done. I mean, we are just so excited. And then it says they got three days and they found no water. 
<laughs> and I just laugh when I read that because you know what? That sounds like my life. <laughs> One day I'm singing, oh, you're the best. <laughs> and I am on top of the world and oh, nothing can touch me. I'm unstoppable. And then three days later I wake up and say, I can't even get out of the bed. Lord, where are you? And I'm serious and I thought, hey, man, you nailed it. I'm glad that uh, Moses pinned this down, that they had the ups and the downs. And that's why the songwriter, who I don't even know who he is, who's popular in the state, says he's the God of the hills and valleys. The God of the hills and valleys. (laughs) The God of the hills and the valleys. And can I ask you, and if you don't have it, then you better not nod no, because I'll be upset with you. Is your life a life of hills and valleys? Mine is. Mine is. One day I'm so excited and I feel like I said invincible. Come on, mostly you're good. I feel invincible on top of the world and then the next thing you know I'm saying, Lord, there's not even any water around here. I mean, what the heck, Lord? Where are you? What's going on here? And I want you to notice this. And if you'll grab a hold of this, boy, it's about to get good again. Look at verse number 23. It says, And when they came to Mara, they could not drink of the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Mara. I never stood under, I never understood naming a little girl Mara. It means bitter, baby. Bitter. I mean I mean, y'all might have a cousin named Mara, I'm sorry. And I know a girl named Mara, but Mara means bitter. I have an L. Oh, I'm Marla. Marla, yeah, you're you're one. She's one letter away from being one bitter. Just know that. Bitter, but Marla, Marla means bitter. And and look, if when you think it can't get any, or, or maybe when you think start, things are starting to look up, he says we we go three days and we can't find any water. Then we find water and then we take a little sip of it. And you know when you've had something bitter, you're like, <laughs> just like puckers your mouth, like oh god, now we found water and now it's bitter. Okay, so look, I want you to notice this. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? In verse 25, we're in Exodus chapter 15, verse number 25. He cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. And if y'all see where I'm going, it's okay to go ahead and start smiling. If you don't, just smile anyway so you don't look slow. (laughs) And he said, And the Lord showed him a tree. And when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. He made for them a statute and an ordinance and there He proved him. And He said, If you'll hearken to the voice of the Lord and will do that which is right and will give ear to His commandments, keep all these statutes, I'll put none of these diseases upon you which I've brought upon the Egyptians for I am the Lord that healeth thee. So you go from way up on a mountain to into a desert and then now you're in a bitter place. You're in a a place of bitterness where the waters were bitter. And the people cried to the Lord and they cried to Moses and they said, what are we going to drink? And get with me here, it says, the Lord showed him a tree. And he said, if you'll take this tree and you'll put it in those bitter waters, then they will become palatable again. And it says, when he put it in there, those waters, which were before bitter, they became sweet. Now that's just what happened to them. And I had never had a problem with Polk County water where I turned it on and I put my cup under there and then I sipped it and it was bitter. I mean, sometimes it's chunky and brown, but, you know, never never sipping bitter water out of the tap. But when they sipped this water and it was bitter, I mean, I'm just, oh, Lord of mercy. You know, you want to get excited, but then you're like, wait a minute, maybe maybe they're not even following you here. But he said... I got a tree I'll show you and you can cut this tree down and you can put this tree inside those bitter waters and they'll become sweet. In my life, there have been times that were dry and there have been times that were bitter. But the Lord, just like He did to the children of Israel, has shown me a tree. Cut down and put like this, this tree. And He said, you take this tree Because y'all forget what this tree is. Y'all think this tree is jewelry. You think that's just something you hang around your neck and you just say, oh, I just love the cross. Well, it's 24 karat gold. Of course you do. I mean, Lord of mercy, everybody loves the cross. But the Lord would say, look, let me give you a tree that was cut down and it was made like this right here. Let me just let you wrap your head around what was done on this tree right here. He says, just wait for a minute and realize it wasn't just the pouring out of the wrath of God against sin, but that tree was an outstanding testimony of the love that God 
himself had for separated sinners. Amen. And he said, I'll give you a tree. I'll give you a tree. And when you remember what this tree is about, you stick that tree, do you hear me? You stick that tree where the outstanding, phenomenal love of God was displayed in His, I mean, killing His own Son for your sin. You take that tree and you put it in any bitter water and it becomes not so hard to swallow. Are you following what I'm saying? Are you picking up what I'm putting down? I'm telling you. And let me tell you something else. The children of Israel, they had just come off of a victory. The Lord had literally just said, y'all come right after me. Notice how there's no water flowing right here. It's like rolling out the red carpet. He says, you walk right here. And they walked through the Red Sea. The waters closed and killed the Egyptians. And He was still leading them. Hear this. He was still leading them by his very hand he led them to the dry place do you hear me they didn't take a wrong turn at this point it was a mistake that they were in the dry place it was not a mistake that they were in the bitter place it was by the very leading hand of God mm -hmm. that they were in the dry places and then that they came to the bitter places you know why he says I want to teach you something real, right here real quick he said I want to teach you that it's not always singing and shaking the tambourine it's not always that way. He said sometimes there's dry places and then sometimes there's bitter places. But if you'll look to me in those bitter places, I'll give you a tree that you can put in that water. You know, it did the same thing for them that it does to us. It showed them just the fact that God cut down a tree. He showed Moses, you cut down that tree. God fixed their problem for them. And it showed that He was concerned and that He would deliver them through the times of bitterness. And it shows the very same thing for us, that He will deliver us in times of bitterness if we'll look to that tree. And remember what that tree is about. You stick that in any bitter place and it'll make it a whole heck of a lot sweeter. And you know what I love about this story? You see, a lot of us, and I'm not picking on anybody, I've not, I'm not, got nobody in mind, but a lot of us, we get to the bitter places... And what do we do? We lay down and we stop. And we say, yeah, you were good, Lord, <laughs> three days ago when I was worshiping you and shaking my tambourine and, and everything was great and you, you delivered me from victory. But then we get to these dry and bitter times and we want to just stop right there, don't we? Just be honest, don't we? We don't all of a sudden, we don't want to be as faithful to Him anymore. We don't, we don't want to be as, 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 as forthcoming with our praise to Him. We don't want to lift our hands toward Him so quickly. But guess what? You do not stop in the times of bitterness. You know why? Look at verse number 27. Looking on a map would tell me that this is another three days journey. And in verse number 27, it says, And they came to Elam, where there were twelve wells of water, and three score and ten palm trees, and they camped by the waters. Now that sounds like a place I want to be. Lots of water and palm trees. I mean, what does that make you think of? Lots of water and palm trees. And it says they camp there by the waters. In your Christian journey, in your Christian walk, I would say, and I'm not trying to be so literal, but you know what? You probably are three days from happiness to Mara, and you're probably about three days from Mara to Elam. But if you can just always remember that, it'll do you a whole lot of good. You know, that that's what the Christian walk is like. It is a series of hills and valleys and hills and valleys and hills and valleys. And let me tell you one more thing. Don't you think that when you get to a dry place and you get to a bitter place, it means God's disappeared or that you've done something wrong or that you've taken a left turn and you're out in the middle of nowhere. No, it's probably by His very own leading that He takes you there. You know why? His people... His people are appointed to trials. Lost people, they just, they just go about and they're just dealing with the ways of the world. But God says, if you're mine, I started a process in you and it's about taking more of you away and putting more of me in. And it'll be basically trial after trial after trial. But at the end of this thing, you'll look a lot more like me and a lot less like yourself. Do you realize that when you got saved, you signed up for trials. You're appointed to trials. But we just have to remember, you can't go questioning God in the middle of the dry places, in the middle of the bitter places. You just got to trust Him and look to that tree. Look to that tree. A God who would send His very Son to shed His blood and die for you, 
doesn't just send you through valleys to mess with you. I mean, you know what I mean? He doesn't just put you in a dry place to watch you struggle. He's sending you there. He's leading you there to teach you something. So it's three days from Mara to Elam and back again. And if you look in chapter 16, look at a couple things. He says in verse number 3, they got out of here again. I mean, my Lord, you were just camped by the water with palm trees and, I mean, wells, come on. And then chapter number 16, verse number 2, the whole congregation's murmuring again. Verse number 3, they said to them, Would to God we just died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots. At least we had buckets of meat around. I mean, sounds like all of us, doesn't it? Bunch of, well, never mind. And it says, And when we had bread to eat to the full, man, we loved the buffet. I know we were slaves, but we still had food to eat. Lord of mercy, get your priorities in order. And then he says in verse number 3, he says, he said, Now he's going to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Now don't think literal about hunger. I'm thinking literal about hunger. I'm thinking, Lord of mercy, what if he's a bunch of big, you know, buffet loving queens around here? I mean, but you know what? But but I want you to notice this. It says they were they were filled with hunger. And look at verse number twelve. The Lord said, I've heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. He said, Speak unto them, saying, At even ye shall eat flesh, and in the morning you'll be filled with bread, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. Now there's more to the manna than just he provided manna. It's also a picture of the Christian walk in that, yes, He'll lead you through high places. He'll lead you through low places. Sometimes you want to shout and dance and shake a tambourine and then you're in a dry place. Then you're in a bitter place. And you know, this, uh, this idea of manna right here is so important. You know what it shows? He showed them that I'm going to provide for you. He said, but you're going to have to get up. Y'all see where I'm going? Every morning... You're going to have to get up every morning and you're going to have to go out and you're going to have to get your little taste of manna. But you're going to have to get it every day. And I'm not going to read it, but he says in there, he says, you don't go bagging it up, y'all bunch of, you know, <laughs> fill in your words there. Don't go bagging up the food now, he said. You can't get enough on Monday for Tuesday. You can't just grab for the whole week. And he even says that if you keep it... He told them not to do that. And look at what they did in verse number 20. Notwithstanding, they hearkened not to Moses. They didn't listen to him. But some of them left of it until the morning. It bred worms and it stank. I mean, I'd be mad if that was my neighbor. Like, look at you. you God, piling up that crap he said not to. And now the whole neighborhood stinks. <laughs> I'm just being honest. I'd be like, he told us not to do that. God, now we got to put clothespins on our nose. <laughs> well, I didn't even have clothespins. Anyway, but are you seeing that? That just like they had to go out and gather manna every day, we have to get up and we have to get our taste of God, our bread, every single day. You know what you can't do? You can't come in here on Sunday and say, well, I'll let Jennifer read from the Word of God and I'll let Blake read from the Word of God. Man, I've got enough Bible to get me through the whole darn week. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. We have to get up every morning and go gather our taste of God. You can't save enough for the next day. It's a daily thing. Let me just say this. I'm proud of every one of you women who are reading. I don't care if you're behind. I don't care if it's taking you three days to read one day. I don't care if you're still back in Job. I don't care about that. The fact that most of you or a lot of you or some of you, I don't know, that you are getting up and you're making time and you're reading in God's Word. Let me tell you something. This was what He said they would have to do. You're going to have to get up and you're going to have to gather your food every day if you want to live. Listen, you'd be surprised at what a difference it makes in your day. You'd be surprised. I mean, you say, well, I just got up and I was reading laws. Yeah, but still... It's your feeding your spiritual side instead of just always feeding your fleshly side. And God will always provide enough to get you through the day if you'll get up and seek Him with each day. Now let's, let's kind of skim on. That's a picture from manna. Chapter number 17, uh, they're continuing to go. Chapter number 19, chapter number 20, He gives them the laws. Chapter number 21 and 22, I'm a little offended that y'all didn't think my rules were funny, but I'm going to let that go this time um, I mean I was putting all those funny hashtags some of y'all don't know what I'm talking about okay look at verse look at chapter 22 
Chapter 22. I mean, I think they're this funny. I'm going to say them again. Sorry, Tiffany. You're just trying to listen to them again. Okay. <laughs> Chapter 22, verse number 6. I'll give you some, 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 some deep notes to write in your Bible. You ready? Verse number 6. If fire break out and catch in the thorns so that the stacks of the corn or the standing corn of the field are consumed therewith, he that kindleth the fire shall surely make restitution. Hashtag Smokey Bear. <laughs> Everybody Hashtag Smokey Bag. I mean Smokey Bear. <laughs> All right, turn over. I got another good one. Chapter number 22. I think this is important. This is deep, y'all. This is deep. <laughs> Chapter 22, verse number 16. If a man entice a maid that is not betrothed and lie with her, he shall surely endow her to be his wife. Hashtag put a ring on it. <laughs> Nobody was I started to call you and say, Ashley, you don't think I'm funny? Come on, comment. Ain't this funny? Verse number 18 of that same chapter, chapter 22, verse number 18. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Hashtag Salem witch trials. <laughs> all right. Verse number 26. Marla, listen to this. If thou at all take thy neighbor's raiment, you borrow somebody's clothes. Thou shalt deliver it unto him by the time the sun goes down. Hashtag bring my stuff back. <laughs> bring my stuff back. <laughs> verse number 28. Verse number 28. Thou shalt not revile the gods nor curse the ruler of thy people. Hashtag quit cussing Trump. <laughs> verse 31. Ye shall be holy men unto me. He said, Neither shall ye eat any flesh that is torn of the beasts in the field. Ye shall cast it to the dogs. Hashtag, don't eat roadkill. That's what he's saying. Y'all are done. Let's go on. Okay, forget it. Thank you. I like just a little... I said hashtag light them up. <laughs> Tar and feather. Right. All right. Then there's more. I mean, there's more, but I'll just let you look for them yourself. But, you know, when somebody says, how do I get through these laws? Man, there's a lot of good stuff in there. There's a lot of good stuff in there. And, uh, well, chapter 23, verse number 11. Just one more. <laughs> But the seventh year thou shalt let it rest. He's talking about the garden and lie still, that the poor of thy people may eat, and what they leave the beasts of the field shall eat. He said, you should deal with the vineyards. Well, my dad even did that. It's called crop rotation. You've got to let your, your, your stuff rest, you know. And I said, give that garden a break. <laughs> and that is, a, that is a, a, a truth, right? I mean, a farmer will tell you that. You can't just plant and plant and plant and plant. Okay, anyway. Now, back to the seriousness. All right, look at chapter 23. Chapter 23 is really the last thing I want to say, and we'll have time to share this morning and talk and say whatever you, you know, you're feeling or what you're thinking. But you know, in chapter uh, 23, I want you to look at this. We're talking about how that the Lord brought them out. Egypt has always been a picture of the world. Canaan has always been a picture of the victorious Christian life. We talked about how it's a series of hills and valleys, hills and valleys, but there is a cross that will make every, there is a tree that will make every bitter moment sweet. And you know what? Just like they were living day to day on manna, we have to live day to day on gathering bread that God will give us from His Word. And then we get here to chapter number 23, and this is the last thing I want to look at. Look at verse number uh, 23. He said, My angel shall go before thee. He's taken them from Egypt as slaves into the promised land of Canaan. He says in verse number 23, My angel shall go before thee and bring thee into the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, Canaanites, Hivites, and Jebusites, and I will cut them off. Now, he's bringing them into a land with a lot of ites. Okay? Obviously. And in verse number 24, he said, And thou shalt not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do after their works, but you should utterly overthrow them. Now some of y'all see where I'm going with this too. Verse number 25, You shall serve the Lord your God. This has been and will continue to be the whole point of my walk with the Lord. He's trying to take me from somewhere I was. He's trying to give me a victorious walk as a believer, as a Christian. But there's something that we have to do. He said, I'm taking you into a land that's got a lot of ites. Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hivites. And look at verse number 30. He said, by little and little I will drive them out from thee. 
until thou be increased and inherit the land. He said, I won't, send, I won't just send them out in one year. Verse 29 said, I will not drive them out before thee in one year. He said, but little by little I will drive them out. And verse 31 at the end, he said, thou shalt drive them out before thee. Verse number 33, thou, they shall not dwell in your land, lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare unto, the, unto me. The whole point of the Christian life is that he says, look, I've given you everything you need to be victorious, but there will be things that you have to work on. He said, and little by little, I'm trying to drive them out of your land. This is your land. This is your vessel, this body that you have. And he said, little by little, you've got to drive them out. You don't serve them. You don't worship them. See, we see it in the context that he's talking about there. He says, you're going to have to shove these Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, Hittites, whatever. He said, you're going to have to drive them all out of your land. And the same thing is true that he would say to every one of us. He would say, and I'm not going to start calling people's names, but hey, you, there's certain things in your land. You've got to let me drive them out. He said, you can't serve it anymore. You can't go by its ways. You can't continue to worship it. You can't continue to allow it to stay there. Because if you allow it to stay there, it's surely going to be a snare unto me. And as you sit here and think, you might be thinking of things that I'm not thinking of. Because I have different ites in my life than you have in yours. But the whole point... The whole journey of being a Christian, literally, I mean, I don't think I'm oversimplifying it. I really don't. I think He redeems us just like He did the children of Israel. I think it's a series of hills and valleys that He will take us through. And I think that the, the end product, the whole point He's trying to make is that you're going to have to let me drive these things out of your life that they won't be a snare to you anymore. Some of us would sit here and say, man, there's things I've dealt with my whole life. I still, I'm still struggling. They still get me every time. I mean, maybe it's your attitude or maybe it's your stubbornness or maybe it's your ideas about this or your finances or your materialistic nature or this or that or this or that. I don't know and I don't even want to start naming. I mean, people have all kinds of problems. They have drug addictions. They have all these different things. And God says, look, you got to let me drive them out. Little by little, it's what I'm trying to do. And unfortunately, I watch people and you watch people too. You want to say, girl, if you don't give that up. I mean, don't we? And with 2020 vision, we look at somebody else's life and we think, Lord, if you don't let the Lord take that away from you, if you don't allow Him to give you the victory over that, it's going to keep on being a snare to you. And as you watch and you continue to read, here we are just in Exodus chapter 23 or wherever we are, 24, 24. And you know what? He's starting to tell them, you're going to run into a whole lot of stuff and you're going to have to drive them out. And as we continue to read, you watch. Some of them, they'll drive them out, but they'll say, but we want to keep this little grove of gods right over here. We'll, we'll drive them out, but we still want to keep hanging on to this right here. And God said, you've got to utterly, utterly, one of my favorite verses is when he comes up, when he comes, the Lord comes and he says, What is this bleeding in my ears? Bleating, not bleeding. His ears weren't bleeding. He said, What are this, what is this bleeding in my ears? He said, I told you to get rid of everything. And is that lambs I hear? Because that was the whole that's what they always wanted to do. They always wanted to halfway obey what God was telling them to do. Oh, we'll kill all the people, but then we'll keep all the... He said, that's not what I told you to do. Now, what I challenge you to do is you need to get along with God at some point today or this week and say, God, what is it that you want to drive out of my life? And what is it that has been a snare in my relationship to you that you're trying, you're working, you're darn this to get out of my life? Lord, let me, let me surrender it to you and let me give it to you and let me trust you to give me victory over that hang-up in my life. Does that make sense?